Today's lecture will be on classification in specific decision trees. The learning objectives are to explain what is classification, to define decision tree, to compare the advantages and disadvantages of decision tree, we will build a decision tree and we will evaluate the decision tree. Now, what is classification? It is a data mining function that assigns items into categories or classes. The goal of classification is to accurately predict the target class for each case in the data. Some examples of classification tasks are, you can use the classification model to identify loan applicants as loan medium or high risk. So let's say, for example, a bank is trying to determine if they should give or approve a loan for a client. Using decision trees, you can identify a model to classify these clients and put them into different risk categories. And then based on these risk, risk categories, you will approve or deny a loan. It can also be used in medicine to predict tumor cells as benign or malignant. And of course, it can be used in finance again to really classify credit card transactions as legitimate or fraudulent. Now, it can also be used in education for us to model what will determine a student passing or failing a course. It can generally be used across different business segments to kind of identify what are the different factors that would influence a client accepting or rejecting a product offer. So classification in general is giving you the opportunity to identify those patterns that will determine what grouping, what class, uh, object, or a person is placed in. And from that, you can use it to make different business decisions based on the domain that you're working in. So a classification rule help assign new objects to classes. For example, Giving a new automobile insurance applicant, should he or she be classified as a low risk, medium risk, or high risk applicant, right? And so classification rules can be used to take different variables or factors to determine how it affects the credit risk. So for example, we could look at how education, salary, and the age of the person impacts their classification or their credit risk as excellent, good, or average. So here in our example, we have for all persons P who has a, de a master's degree and an income greater than 75,000, this person is classified, would be classified as an excellent um, credit risk. Now, we would end up with these classific classifications based on the patterns that we see in the data. An important thing to note is that rules are not necessarily exact and there may be misclassifications and we'll go about looking at misclassifications later on in this lecture. Lecture Classification rules can be presented as a decision tree and that's the methodology that we're going to be used to look, going to be using to look at classification. We're going to be taking advantage of the decision tree method. So what is a decision tree? A decision tree is a hierarchical collection of rules that describes how to divide a collection of records into successively smaller groups of records. The aim of the division is to have a resulting segment where it is considered to be pure because the elements that we're grouping together are more similar than different. As we go through some exercises, you will recognize what we mean by purity and we'll discuss that even more in depth 
in the lecture. So the decision tree, it is considered a predictive model that is based on a branching series of tests. Now, each of these white nodes is where we would have our different tests happening. Now, the outcome of the test can be binary, which means that there are two outcomes, or the out outcome can be multiple, which if we look at the bottom of this tree here, we have four outcomes on this branch. Now, a decision tree allows us to understand what variables are important and what are not important as we classify and group a particular ph phenomena. It also allows us to spot unexpected patterns. So these are things that we didn't anticipate. And remember, a measure of data mining is that we're looking for those things that we consider to be interesting, but not all, but in being interesting, it should be unexpected and also it should be actionable. So it gives us an opportunity to look for those unexpected patterns. So the structure of the decision tree, it consists of a root, which is at the, the very head of the tree. And it also consists of nodes, which is where we branch off to make our decisions. It has leaves, which are, which are in black at the very bottom of the tree. And we have splits, which is where the decision takes place and we end up at the different leaves. So at each node, a decision is made, which variable to split on and how to split that variable. These are the variables that are most important. So at the nodes where we're making the split, these are the variables that are important and this is where we see what patterns in, impact our classification. Now all records landing at the same leaf get the same prediction. So some pros and cons of decision trees. Pros is that it's reasonable training time, which really means it doesn't take a lot of time to build the model. You can also apply the, re the results from the model quite quickly. It is easy to inter interpret, it's easy to implement, and it can handle a large number of attributes. On the cons, it cannot handle complicated relationships between variables. And problems are created if you have lots of missing data. So as much as possible, your data set needs to be complete if you're going to be executing decision trees on that data. So the purpose of a decision tree, you're given a collection of records. So you're given a file with some records in it, and we refer to those records as or training set. And our training set is really what we're using to build our model. Each record will contain a set of attributes. One of the attributes is going to be the class. So one of the attributes is going to be what we are trying to predict. The other attributes are going to impact the prediction. These attributes will identify the patterns that results in a particular object or person to be in different classes. Now, the aim is to find a model for the class attribute as a function of the others, right? So you have your class attribute, which let's say it's pass or fail. It's the performance, the class attribute is the performance you, you um, output in a particular course. So we, that's our class attribute. Now we want to explain what could impact somebody getting an A, B, or a C in the course. And we want to explain that based on other attributes such as the gender of the person, the age of the person. We can also be looking at their educational background, work experience if that is important. And we're going to use these factors to kind of give us an understanding of what impacts those grades. So that is the intent of creating our model. Now, once we have created our model, 
we also need to do a process of validation to see if the model works. To do that, we want to take previously unseen records, so records that were not used to build the model, and we want to check it against the tree to see if it will predict these things accurately that it has never seen before. Now, the data set that we use to evaluate the performance of the tree is called the test set. So the test set is used to determine the accuracy of the model. Usually, you have a data set that you divide in, in two parts. 80% you'll use as a training set to build the model, and the next 20% you use as the test set to evaluate the model. So here, graphically, we're displaying, we have our training set, and we also have our training set that is creating the model, right? So it's learning to create the model. And then we have the test set where we apply the model to the test data in order to draw some conclusions based on does the model predict the class variable accurately as we anticipate. In executing decision trees for this course, we'll be using the Hunt's algorithm. And the Hunt's algorithm will be used to grow the tree in a recursive fashion by partitioning the training records into successively purer subsets. So the steps in the Hunt algorithm is that we start at the root node with all records in the training set, and we draw the tree from left to right. We consider every split on every variable and choose the split that maximizes a measure of purity. For each shell of the root node, we again search for the best split, and we repeat this until eventually the process stops when there's no good split available or the leaves are considered pure. Now let's look at an example for decision tree to identify tax evasion. We have a data set here that we will use to build a model. The data set consists of four attributes, refund, marital status, taxable income, and cheat. Cheat here represents the class variable, and cheat rep really represents if somebody has cheated on their taxes before or not. So we want to explain how persons will be classified as either not cheating or cheating on their taxes as a function of the attributes refund. So have they done a refund before? If they're single married or divorced and what is their taxable income? So using the Hunt's algorithm, we start first by evaluating the outcome, the predominant outcome that is there in the classification variable. And when we look at cheat, we recognize that most of the outcomes from a very high level are don't cheat. So of course, when we look at that outcome, it's a mixture of yes and no, and it's not a pure node. So we must now evaluate it in relation to our first variable, which is refund. So when refund is yes, that is record one, record four, and record seven, the corresponding result for cheat is no. So for those three records, record one, record four, and record seven, the corresponding result for cheating on taxes is no when refund is yes. So that takes care of the left side of this node. When we move to the right, the next option is that refund could be no. So when refund is no, and we look at cheating on taxes, there is a mixture of results. We have for record two and three, the corresponding result for cheating is no. However, when we look at record five, the corresponding result is yes. For record six, 
corresponding is no and again a mixture with record eight and nine in refunded no we're seeing yes for record eight and no for record nine and so we would consider that this node this leaf is not pure because when refund is no we're seeing a number of results for cheating on taxes so it means therefore we have one side of our tree for refund being no having results that are not pure and remember that the aim of a decision tree is to end up with leaves that are pure as possible where the results are similar now because this is not pure we must now add marital status to the tree when we add marital status to the tree just to be clear on the left of the tree where it says refund yes don't cheat this is a pure node so we will not revisit this branch of the tree however where refund is no we add marital status we see that where when persons are single or divorced we are we have a result in both not cheating and cheating for taxes so let's look for record for record three where refund is no and the person is single the result is no cheat for record five where refund is no and the person is divorced the result is cheat for record eight refund is no the person is single the result is yes cheat on taxes for record 10, no, person is single, yes, cheat on taxes. So this is not a pure node. When we move to the right of the tree and we look at all instances where a refund is no and the person is married, we realize that they don't cheat on their taxes. So let's look at the corresponding records for this. When we look at record two, refund is no, the person is married, they don't cheat on their taxes. Record six, refund is no, person is married, they don't cheat on their tax. Record nine, refund is no, person is married, they don't cheat on their tax. So we can safely say that this branch of the tree, it is pure. When refund is no and the person is married, they will not cheat on their tax. However, to the left of that branch, where a person is single or divorced, that is not a pure node so we must now add taxable income to that side of the tree when we add taxable income and refund is no and the person is single or divorced we recognize that where taxable income is less than eighty thousand, these people do not cheat on their taxes but where the taxable income is greater than or equal to eighty thousand, these people cheat on their taxes as a result, we now have a model where all the leaves are pure. So in evaluating our results, the nodes refund, marital status, taxable income in yellow, these are our variables or nodes that we split on. And of course, at the very end of this tree, we have our class labels, which really represent the class variable cheat um, those are in blue and these are also considered our leaves on the lines that are coming from the splitting attributes or the nodes we have our test outcomes right so to be clear usually at the very top of the table provided the headings will be the names that are placed in the splitting attributes. Those become the names of the nodes. And the results that are listed in the records become the test outcomes that label the lines. And at the very end of the tree, the leaves consist of the information that is represented under the class variable. 
Now, remember that the goal of a decision tree is to build a model and then validate the model using test data. So let's run some test, a test case against the tree. Our test data is here. And what we're trying to do is to predict if this person will cheat or not cheat on our taxes. So let's trace the tree. We start first by refunding no. So we end up to the right of the tree. We then look at marital status and the person is married. So we continue on this side of the tree and we end up with a result that says no, they will not cheat on their taxes and that is their classification. So now let's talk about the best way to split the data for a test condition. This is really based on the type of attribute or the type of data that we're working with. Now, decision tree works with three different types of data. It's either nominal categorical, which means this is categorical data. For example, gender can be male or female. Colors can be black, blue, orange, gray. A fruit could be banana, apples, cranberries. So those are nominal categorical data. But we also have ordinal categorical data. This means that the data is in categories, but it has an order to it. For example, education level, primary, secondary, tertiary. With each level, we're increasing the level of education and therefore it is an ordinal variable. For decision trees, our data can be continuous, which means any numerical value can be represented. An example of a continuous variable would be age or salary or interest rate, price or cost. Now, there are two types of splits. Splits can either be two-way or multi-way. So you can either have two outcomes when you split on a variable, or you can have three or more outcomes. So let's look at splitting the variables, either multi-way or binary split. And this is an example with nominal attributes. So with the multi-way split, we have car type, and we are splitting car type based on family car, sports car, and luxury car. So those are three branches. And the number of splits we really end up with is based on how many partitions we have in the data that are distinct values. But we could take the same data and end up with a binary split where we divide the values into two subsets and the aim really is to ensure that we end up with a purity of nodes, which means that what we have classified within the leaves are as similar as possible. So using the same data, we could split car type on sports and luxury and family by itself, or we could group family and luxury and have sports by itself. So in this example, we're looking at splitting based on ordinal attributes. Now, with ordinal attributes, the split is very similar with the multi-way. We're splitting based on how many distinct partitions we have. So with size here, we're splitting on small, medium, and large. However, with the binary split, it's slightly different. We divide, of course, the values in two subsets, but we must respect the order. And that's how we find optimal, optimal partitioning must be based on the order. So we can group small and medium on one side and large on the other, or we can group medium and large and small on the other side, but we can never group large and small on one side because we must maintain the order. Now, when we're splitting variables based on them being continuous attributes, the different ways that we can split, we can either change that value to form an 
an ordinal categorical attribute. For example, if we have the age of persons, we could change from having the num the actual numbers to put in persons in the category of toddlers, teenagers, preteens, young adults, etc. So we could move and reclassify the solid numbers to actual categories. So that would be moving it to our ordinal classification. We could also do a binary split on the continuous variable itself where we split where the variable is less than or greater than a value, less than a value or greater than or equal to a value. Um, this would have been the case in the previous example when we were examining examining if somebody would cheat or not cheat on their taxes. Of course, we consider the split that finds the best cut in the data where we end up with maximum purity. So here's an example with a binary split. We are changing the variable to ask the question if the person's income is greater than 80,000. And then we have the results being yes or no. So that's one way to achieve the binary split. With the multi-way split, we have the taxable income and we basically have several branches coming off, each branch representing a range for the income. So the first, the first branch here would be all those persons who have taxable income less than 10,000. The next one would be between 10,000 to 25,000 and so on and so forth. So this would be breaking up the income into different segments to determine where within the classification um, that person or object ends up. So finding a good split at a decision tree node, there are many ways to find a good split, but there are two things that we really want to achieve Splits are preferred where the children are the same, similar in size, and splits are preferred where each child is as pure as possible. So we want, for example, in terms of similar in size, if you're grouping persons by age, we want to ensure that we group persons that are very similar in age together. If it's income, we want to group things that are similar in income. And we want each node, each not each leaf, to be as pure as possible where the things that we're grouping together, we're aiming for all of them to be the same. Sometimes we don't necessarily end up with all being the same, but the intent is to achieve that level of purity. So most algorithms seek to maximize the purity of the children or the leaf node. So let's assess an example to determine a best split. So we want to achieve, of course, nodes or leaves with a homogeneous class distribution where things are as similar as possible. So to our left, we have a node with five C zeros, five C one. This has a high degree of impurity because there's equal mixture of both elements. But when we look to the right, the node that we have here has 9C0, 1C1, so we would say that this has a low degree of impurity because it's predominantly C0. So take a look at this example. We have three different splits. We have a split on whether somebody owns a car, car type, or they have a student ID. Now, based on the classification coming out in the leaves, which test condition would you say is the best? Go to the ELS and post your response. Now, outside of the splitting conditions for decision trees, we are also very mindful that performance measures are very important. Now, after a decision tree is constructed, each leaf node has a score. And a least score is the likelihood that the more common class will arise. 
outside of the least score, the decision tree also has an accuracy score, which is calculated as the total number of records that have been classified, and that's the denominator, and the numerator is the number of records that are correctly classified. So if you're trying to predict 10 per, whether 10 persons would be approved for a loan, those 10, 10 persons, the count of 10 would be the denominator. And if we were able to accurate, accurately predict that seven of them would receive the loan, then our accuracy would be seven out of 10. Now, we will get more into accuracy as we start working through the examples. Now, here's an example in calculating the accuracy of a decision tree. We have a decision tree here that is assessing whether someone will buy a widget or not. Now, we're trying to predict that based on whether the live in New York or do not live in New York and also based on their age. So when we run the test data, test data that we're running against this tree is really 20 records. And we start at the first node in yellow where we have 11 yeses and nine noes. Those are the test records that we're running against the tree. And based on the outcome, when we look at the, the first branch, which says the residence is not equal to New York, that node should end up with predictions of only no's, but we do end up with one yes and six no. So it means that in terms of the accuracy from that branch, the tree has not predicted all elements correctly. When we move to the other side of the, the tree, where residents equal New York and the age group is greater than 35, we have two yeses and three noes being predicted, and this is a no node. So again, two things have not been correctly predicted. And when we move to the very last branch where we have age being less than or equal to 35, we have all yeses predicted correctly. So in this calculation, in total, we have 20 records being checked against the tree. So that 20 forms the denominator. The numerator are those things that we accurately predicted. So here we have, we have an accurate prediction of the six nodes being the same as this node here. So we have six in the numerator. And then when we move to the other side of the tree, we have, this is a no node, right? And we have three nodes being accurately predicted. So this is the three here. And then at the very end, this is a yes node and we have all yeses being predicted correctly. So we have the eight here. And so our total calculation is six plus three plus eight, which the accurate predictions over the total number of records is 20, and I have this 20 because I know here that we're starting off with this 11 plus 9. And so the accuracy of this three, this tree is 85%. Now, another important measure for decision trees is testing how accurately the tree has predicted each class. So the counts of the test records that are correctly or incorrectly predicted by the classification model. And we use a confusion matrix to represent these results. So the confusion matrix says we have an actual class that represents the outcome. And then we have our predicted class that represents what we're trying to predict to determine how a particular thing will behave. Now, when we look 
at our confusion matrix, we want to determine did we accurately predict all class one, all class one variables as class one variables. And if we do, that accuracy calculation here is reflected in this area where we have the total number of predictions as the denominator divided by the correct number of predictions as the numerator and it gives us how accurately that class predicts the outcome. And then conversely, we have the error rate which represents the inverse of the accuracy really, which is the number of records that were incorrectly predicted over the total number of predictions. And that represents um, the error rate. Now, this will become clearer as we work through some examples. So don't be too alarmed by the name confusion matrix and don't be too alarmed by the matrix here. But as we work, we're gonna work through some examples from start to finish, and it hopefully will be a lot clearer. Now let's construct another decision tree. And what we're trying to predict, we want to predict the class variable of whether we will go sailing or not so there's two possibility we can either yes go sailing or no do not go sailing and we want to predict these things as a function of the following attributes outlook whether it is sunny or rainy whether we have company to come with us on the boat or whether the sailboat is small or big so we want to make create our decision tree based on these three attributes and we want to predict if we would go sailing or not so we start first with outlook now when we start with outlook we recognize that outlook can either be sunny or rainy now let's look at our tree for records for record one to five outlook is sunny and when outlook is sunny for the class variable we have all yeses so we can safely say when outlook is sunny the results for going sailing is yes, we will always go sailing. And this node is pure. On the other hand, when outlook is rainy, we have a number of outcomes. The outcomes are for record six, we have no, record nine, we have no, record 10, we have no, but for record seven and eight, we have yes. So this is not pure. So now, because it's not pure, we go ahead and we add if we have company or not. When we include company, we recognize that when it is rainy and we have no company, that is record six, record nine, rainy no company we end up with a no that means we're not going sailing when we look at when it is rainy and we have medium company so medium company we have yes go sailing for record seven and then we have no go sailing for record 10. So here it would not the results would not be pure if we're only including if we have company. So we must now add sailboat. 
when we add sailboat so when it's rainy medium and the sailboat is small we go sailing so yes when it is rainy medium and the sailboat is big we do not go and those two nodes are pure now we move to the very last thing which is one record left when it is rainy and it is big company we definitely go sailing and this is our decision tree so let's test the model where would we end up so we start with the first record where outlook is sunny we end up here the person will go sailing now remember that decision trees identify for us what is important in our model now some of you may be asking yourselves on this side of the tree we're not seeing company we're not seeing sailboat that is because when it is sunny when it is sunny having company or having a sail sailboat being big or small is not important so once it is sunny with the, what the result is the person will go on the sailboat on the other hand when we move to the second prediction when it is rainy right so we're on this side of the tree when it is rainy when the person has big company then what is the result the result is the person will go sailing so rainy big company they go sailing and that's how we trace the results on the tree test the model now let's examine the worksheet and work through some examples question one consider the following database of houses represented by five training examples the target attribute is acceptable which can have values yes or no this is to be predicted based on the other attributes of the house construct the decision tree for the following and calculate the accuracy of the model and the prediction for each class using a confusion matrix so here we have a training data set with five different records we want to predict whether a house will be acceptable for passing so this is a real estate company and they're trying to determine if they will accept a house um, in order to put it on the market for sale so the class variable is acceptable so this is what we're predicting and we're predicting if we will accept it yes or no and we're predicting it as a function of three variables which are furniture number of rooms and a new kitchen now this first column here that says house this just this only represents the record number and this is not an attribute so this is only the record number here that says house so let's get into the question so step one in the question is to construct the decision tree and we start first by looking at the impact of the house having furniture and how this impact the classification of the house being acceptable or not so we start first by looking at when there is no furniture in the house what is the outcome for acceptable so for record one when furniture is no we see where acceptable is yes when furniture is no again we see for record three acceptable is yes when furniture is no for record four we see where acceptable is no so to the left of the tree furniture is no we end up with a leaf that has two yes and one no 
therefore, this branch, this leaf is not pure. We now move to the right side of the tree. We look at record two, when furniture is yes, we have a corresponding no for acceptable for record two. And when furniture is yes, so record five, we have a corresponding yes for record five. So therefore, on this side of the tree, when furniture is yes, the outcome is not pure because we have one no and one yes. Now, I like to build the tree in phases. Some persons will be able to build the tree in one go and add each variable. For simplicity, it is much easier for you to create the tree by evaluating each variable. So after this first iteration, we recognize that when we look at furniture being yes or no, the resulting leaves are not pure. And therefore, the next step is we must add number of rooms to the tree to bring more, more purity to the leaves. Still on step one, to construct the decision tree, in this iteration, we'll be including number of rooms to bring more purity to the model. So we will evaluate furniture and number of rooms to see its impact on the house being acceptable or not. We start first with record one, when furniture is no and number of rooms are three, we have a resulting yes for acceptable. We also look at record four. It has a similar pattern for furniture being no, number of rooms being three. However, acceptable in this case is no. This corresponds to the leftmost side of the tree. Furniture is no, number of rooms are three, and we end up with a leaf that has one yes and one no, and therefore this is not pure. We now evaluate when furniture is no, and number of rooms are four, we have a resulting yes for acceptable. On the tree, furniture is no, number of rooms are four, resulting yes in this leaf, and this is a pure leaf. Next, we move to the rightmost side of the tree. When furniture is yes, number of rooms are three, we end up with acceptable being no. Furniture is yes, number of rooms are three, we end up with a pure node with acceptable being no. We move to the final record. When furniture is yes, number of rooms are four. We have a resulting yes for acceptable. Furniture is yes, number of rooms are four. We have a resulting yes for acceptable, and this is a pure node. Therefore, we end up in this iteration with a tree that has three pure leaves and one leaf that is not pure. For this leaf that is not pure, we will introduce in the next iteration, new kitchen to determine if new kitchen will bring more purity. So we're still on step one. However, this time we are including all three attributes, new kitchen, number of rooms and furniture. And we're looking to evaluate how it affects acceptable. Now, an important point to note is that all branches that ended up with pure leaves will not be changed in this iteration. So this leaf 
this leaf and this one were all pure in the previous iteration and we are only evaluating the impact of new kitchen on the leftmost side of the tree to bring purity. So the records that form this branch of the this branch of the tree are record one when furniture is no and number of rooms are three and new kitchen is yes we end up with a corresponding yes for acceptable so that is furniture is no number of rooms are three new kitchen is yes we end up with yes as the result and this is a pure leaf and then the next record on this side of the tree is furniture being no record four number of rooms are three new kitchen is no and the result for acceptable is no and therefore furniture no number of rooms three new kitchen no we end up with this no this leaf that has no and it is a pure leaf based on these results we have used up all the attributes from the data and we now have a tree where we have all leaves as pure and that is the intent of a decision tree to ensure we end up with pure leaves now that we have our decision tree the next step is that we must validate how well the decision tree performs now a decision tree is validated against test records you have been provided with three test records these records have a particular outcome tied to them we know what the outcome is so for record one where furniture is no number of rooms are four and new kitchen is no the corresponding outcome for acceptable is no the record two the outcome is no and record three the outcome is yes now our intent is to run these results against the tree to see if the tree will make the prediction based on what the based on what the actual outcome was we will compare the actual results these are actual results against our prediction to determine how well the tree performs so let's start our evaluation our first record record one furniture is no number of rooms are four we end up with a prediction of yes so this is or yes now when we look at what our prediction is and what the actual outcome is we recognize that they are not the same so the actual outcome was no but our tree predicted yes and therefore this is a misclassification we evaluate the next record furniture is no number of rooms are three a new kitchen is yes we end up again here with a prediction of yes so we have a prediction of yes however the actual result was no therefore this record has been misclassified as well by the tree now let's look at the very last record when furniture is yes and number of rooms are four we end up with a prediction of yes so the yes here matches with the yes here that we had for the actual and therefore the tree predicted this one record as correct so now we calculate the accuracy of the tree after running the test records against the tree our denominator is the total number of records that we would have evaluated against the tree we evaluated three records and therefore we 
have a denominator of three. The accuracy is how many of those three records were classified correctly. We only classified this last record, record three, as correct. And therefore, the accuracy of this tree in making predictions is one out of three, or 33.33%. .33%. In the previous slide, we calculate the accuracy of the overall performance of the tree, which was 33.33%. This means that the tree would, can accurately predict outcomes at an accuracy level of 33.33%. But there are times when we're not just interested in the overall performance of the tree, but we want to evaluate the performance of how each class behaves in terms of predictions. We start first by looking at how accurate the tree is in predicting when a house will be acceptable. So when acceptable is yes, how accurate is the tree in predicting if the house would actually be acceptable? So we have our three test records and when we evaluate when our actual outcome was yes, if acceptable being yes, we made a prediction of yes 100% of the time. So here, for this record, we are saying when acceptable was yes, was actually yes, we correctly predicted it as yes 100% of the time. In the same row, we should read this as when acceptable is yes, how many times did we predict it as no? This never happened, so this is 0%. If you look at your test data here, when acceptable is yes, all the yeses were predicted as yes. And so therefore, you would not have any percentage being, mis, being misclassified here within acceptable being yes and predicted being no. However, when we move to the next row, when acceptable is no, all right, so in our actual data, we have two cases of acceptable being no that corresponding to our case here. So when acceptable is no, and when we look at our actual predicted outcomes, we see that acceptable was not predicted as no. So where acceptable is no here, and we go over this side, none of them were actually predicted as no. So that's why we have zero here. However, all of our acceptable being no's were predicted as yeses incorrectly. So that's why we have the two out of two or 100% here. So we have a 100% misclassification for the tree predicting no when the house would not be acceptable, but we have a 100% accuracy prediction when the tree should predict if the house will be acceptable. So let's look at question two. Using the decision tree algorithm, calculate the decision tree for the following data set and the accuracy of the model, create a confusion matrix for the tree. All right, so we have a number of records here. And what we are trying to predict, the class variable, is result. And we're trying to predict if somebody will have sunburn or have no sunburn. And we're doing this based on the type of hair they have, their height, their weight, and if they use suntan lotion or not. Right now, again, the first column here name is just to identify the record, it is not used in the building of the tree. So let's get into the question. 
we start first by evaluating how the persons here will affect the results of them being sunburned or not. So we start first by looking at those persons that have brown hair. So brown hair, Alex has brown hair. So does Pete and so does John. And when we evaluate Alex Brown here, he got no sunburn. Pete has no sunburn. And John has no sunburn. So for these three records, for persons with brown hair, they end up with no sunburn. And this is a pure node. We now move to the right side of the tree and all the other records are blonde. And when we look at the blonde records, so Sarah, for example, Sarah is sunburned, but Dana has no sunburn. So there's a mixture um, going down with the persons that are blonde. So when we evaluate those persons with blonde hair, we end up with two persons having sunburn, three having no sunburn, and therefore this record, this leaf is not pure, and we must now move to the next iteration to include height in the model. So we include height on the side of the model that was not pure, and we're looking at all blonde persons. So blonde persons may have varying height. They may be average, tall, or short. So let's look at how here their height affects the results of them being sunburned or not. So we start first by looking at blonde average people. So when we evaluate Sarah, who is blonde and average, she has sunburn. We look at Julie, who is also blonde and average, has no sunburn. We look at Ruth, who is blonde and average, who also has no sunburn. And so in this side of the tree, blonde, average, we end up with a leaf that has a mixture of one record with sunburn, two with no sunburn, and therefore this is not pure. We now move on to looking at the blonde, tall persons. So Donna is blonde and tall and has no sunburn. And that's the only blonde tall person. So blonde, tall, no sunburn, this is pure. We must also look at all the blonde short persons. So Annie is blonde, short, and sunburn. So Annie is the, o is the only record that has this outcome. And so this is a pure result pure leaf and so we're finished with this side of the tree so now we only have one leaf that is not pure and so we must include weight to see if weight would bring more purity to the results so we're now at the final iteration of the tree we include weight so, of course, this leaf is pure, so is this one, so is this one. So we are only concerned with this aspect of the tree that looks at blonde average persons. So let's look at the data to see if we will get more purity adding weight.
and lotion. So we look at the blonde average person. So that's Sarah. Sarah is blonde and average and she is lightweight. And the result is sunburn. And Julie is blonde, average, lightweight as well. And she is no sunburn. And Ruth is blonde, average, lightweight as well, and no sunburn. So when we look at these results, we're not getting any purity because we still have the same trend across the three records so blonde average and light and they're all resulting in a mixture of sunburn and non sunburn so let's add lotion when we add lotion we end up with we look at Sarah blonde average light no sunburn no lotion sorry and the results is sunburn Julie Blonde, average, light, no lotion, no sunburn. Ruth is blonde, average, light, no lotion again, and still no sunburn. So we have no more attributes to add to this model, and we now end up with a model where one of our leaves are not pure. All right, so this leaf is still not pure, but we do not have any more attributes to add to the model and therefore this is where we end there's no further purity however because this leaf because this leaf has more non-sunburn than sunburn overall we would classify this leaf as a non-sunburn classification so now we're at step two which is to validate the model for accuracy. We were given four records that we must now trace on the tree to determine the prediction against the actual um, outcome. So our outcomes are here in this column that says result. These are actual outcomes. This is actually what happened. And now we are evaluating that against what the tree predicts. So let's start with the this first record here. This person is their hair is brown, and automatically, once the hair is brown, they'll end up with a prediction of non-sunburn. So when we look at our prediction on the tree of non sunburn and the actual prediction the actual results sorry they match so this is a correct validation and if we continue to the next record this person is blonde and they're tall and their prediction on the tree is no sunburn so when we can compare their results of what actually happened and on the tree you'll see where they're matched so again this is a correct prediction so now we move on to the next record this person is blonde and short and the result is that they get sunburn in the prediction. So here it is. So when we compare for record three, the result that actually happened with the prediction, again, they match. So this is correct. And we're at the final record where the person is brown. And again, once they're brown, the result is going to be no sunburn and so that is the this is the classification the prediction of non sunburn but when we compare it to the actual results they don't match so this is a misclassification so 
in determining the accuracy after we've traced the test records against the tree we had a total number of four records and so that's our denominator and how many were accurately predicted which is one two three records so we end up end up with an accuracy of three out of four or 75 percent now i know some of you may be thinking what is a good accuracy for a decision tree this is going to be based on a particular domain that you're working with so in medicine i would say if we're applying decision tree we ought to be looking for accuracies as close to a hundred percent as possible so we're looking at high 90s 99 98 um 100 percent in medicine however if we're looking for example let's say in marketing a product and we're trying to determine the level of accuracy international standards for uptake in terms of prospecting it's between three to five percent so if we had a model that could accurately predict um, prospecting uptake for a product at 10 percent that model would be doing really really well however if we have other domains that are let's say student performance we're trying to evaluate and the institution is expecting a performance of at least a, a 80 percent pass rate then we would want our model to be performing at that level so validation in terms of accuracy and the standard that is set is usually set by the business and it is set within the expectation of how that domain operates now a third step is to calculate the accuracy of the classes um, and we're using the confusion matrix so when we set up our confusion matrix we have an area for the predicted class we have another area for the, the actual outcomes remember the actual outcomes you're given so results here represents our actual outcomes so this is the same thing and our predicted class is the same thing here so when we evaluate our results we're looking at how many actual sunburn were predicted as sunburn so when we look at our results we had two actual sunburns and one of them were predicted as sunburn so here where sunburn was predicted as sunburn we have it as really 50 percent because this is one out of two and on this side where the other sunburn was predicted as none so that is another one out of two so that's 50 percent so we read this as saying 50% of sunburns were predicted accurately as sunburns and the other 50% were predicted inaccurately as none. We now move to the side of the model that deals with the outcomes for those who actually had no sunburn and did we predict them correctly as no sunburn. So when we look at it, all our non-sunburn were, were predicted as non-sunburn. And so where we have non-sunburn here corresponding with non-sunburn, we have 100% being predicted correctly and none of them being predicted incorrectly, which is what this section here stands for. And that is our confusion matrix. So let's move to part two of this lecture, which is conducting decision trees in R. So what we would have worked on on paper, we're now going to automate using an example in R. So our practical exercise is to create a decision tree in R using the HR data and validate the model using the HR test data, both of which are on the ELS. Now the intent of this this exercise is to attempt to predict what factors would impact somebody staying with the company or somebody leaving the company 
as a result of the following attributes. So we have included in the data set the satisfaction level of the staff member, the performance on their last evaluation, the number of projects the staff is working on, average monthly hours worked, time spent with the company in terms of number of years, any work accidents that may or may not have happened, if they have left the company or they're still with the company, and this is the class variable because this is what we're trying to predict, and if, if they have received any promotions, what is their salary and what is their occupation at the company. All right, so we'll start by opening our studio. When you open our studio, you should see the same environment that we were working in the last time when we did the groceries and the Titanic example. So you should see your same project, right? So to the bottom right-hand corner, you can see my project name, Business Analytics 2020. And you can see all the files that I was working on here. So what I'm going to do now is just to create a new R script that we're going to use to do the exercise with the HR data. So just to remind you to create the new R script, you go to file, new file, and R script, and you will get a blank screen and we want to import the data that we need to do the exercise. So when you download the data from ELS, ensure you save it somewhere that is easily accessible, such as your desktop or in my document. So you'll have to go to import data sets. You'll import it from Excel and then browse your computer. Look for the actual data set so we import the hr data set first open and once you click on open you will see a data preview that populates a number of rows pertaining to the records um, from the file so once you see the records here in the preview go ahead and click on import now i have imported in this workspace before but for those of you who are just importing into excel excel is gonna my apologies in r r is gonna ask you to download some packages so you will have to download some packages that will allow you to import the data during um, in R. So you're just going to go ahead and follow those instructions. And then once you have done that, you should see the records and you can go ahead and import the HR data. I'm also going to go ahead and import the HR test data. So go to import data set from Excel browse and you're looking for the location where you have stored your test file so open your file will be preloaded so you'll have a preview there and click on import so I've imported both files in the global environment. You see the HR file. It has 14,950 observations and 10 variables. And the HR test data, which has 49 observations and 10 variables. So we know, since we have the data in the environment, we can go ahead and start typing the instructions to create our decision tree model. So we start first by installing a package that we need um, for this exercise. It's the rpart.plot package. So go to tools, install packages. 
and you type R part and it's the dot plot that we need. So click on R part dot plot and click on install. All right, so once it is successfully installed, you will see the message here at the bottom left of the console that says package our part that plot successfully unpacked. All right, so let's start with our instructions. Um, so we really need two libraries or two packages. One is already preloaded in R, so we're just going to tell R that we would like to load this package in the environment. So we need the R part library. So we, we start by typing library. Again, as we start typing, you'll see the suggestion. So click on library and in brackets, in all common letters, remember that R is case sensitive and you see it start coming up, the R part, click on that option. And I'm just going to put a note here. Remember with notes, we use the hashtag or number sign, right? And this library creates the model, right? So you can go ahead and run this line. Remember that the mouse must be in the line that you want to execute and then you click on run. So if all is well, you will see the line coming up in the console in blue. So of course, the next library we need is the one that would have just now downloaded. We need the R part at plot. So we type library again. And in brackets, R part, and see the suggestion comes up. Click on R part at plot. And the comment this library draws the decision tree all right so go ahead run this line i have a warning that it was built on the version 3.5.3 that should not be an issue if you're getting that message if you're not then all is well just the same so now that we have included all the libraries that we need to complete the exercise, our next step is that we should create the model. And in creating our model, we need a variable to store the model results in. I will name my variable, my results. Now you have a bit of leverage here to name your variable whatever you want to as long as it's not a reserved word in R. If it was a reserved word, you would know because as you start typing, you will see suggestions of, of words that are reserved in R with similar spelling. So once you see the word coming up, you can't use it. So I'm going to use my results and we're going to run the model and place the results in this variable. To do that, we're going to use the arrow so to create an arrow we do the less than sign followed by minus and then we want to use the command r part so as we start typing again you see the suggestion you click on r part and in bracket for this exercise we want to predict if somebody would actually stay or leave a company so the class variable is left so we start first with what we're trying to classify. So if you look in our data set, you'll see left. Where left is zero, it means the person stays with the company. And where left is one, it means the, the person left the company. So let's go back to our R script. And we want to create the model for the person leaving or staying with the company. Um, by running the other attributes against left. So to do that, we use the, the tilde sign. The tilde sign on my keyboard is right below the escape key. 
all right so the tilde sign i have to press shift and then that key and we must specify what variables we want to run in the model i'm going to use a dot because the dot specify use all the variables in the data set if i didn't specify the dot i would literally have to type all names for each variable and that would be quite tedious because there are a number of variables in the file so i specify the dot followed by a comma and then we must specify the method that we want to use and the method as you start typing you'll see method coming up um, the method that we want to use is class because this is the classification and the last thing that we must also specify is what data should be used to build the model so comma data equals and the data is equal to the, the HR data. That's the name of my file. You have to ensure you have the right file name. So whatever your file name is that you have imported. So I have HR here and I have HR in the environment. So this is the same variable. All right, so this line for the comment, I'll put here. building model all right so go ahead and run that line of code all is well you should just see at the bottom and the console the line of code in blue now the next step is that we want to see the actual decision tree so to draw our decision tree we are going to use the r part and we want the r part that plot option because that's what's going to plot the tree and in r part that plot we want to pass my results all right so we're going to put my results so that's what has all results so we can click on that comma we have to specify the type of plot that we want for our tree so there are four options from zero to three and if you look here you can see what the actually six options you can look at what the different options are like so i'm going to work with option three for now and you can go through and interchange the options to see how it affects the tree so for me for us now type equal three comma and we have to this specifies for us falling leaves for the tree if we want all the leaves for the tree to be on one level or we want them to be on different level and i fall leaves for me is going to be f which means falls i fall pause because i want the the leaves to be on different levels when it is created comma cx here specifies what size the text should be so you see some information here from r default no meaning calculate the size automatically since font size are discrete the cx you ask for may not exactly be the cx you get so um you don't have to specify cx it will give you an automatic calculation but i'm going to specify 0.5 for now so that you can see exactly how it works so the comment here is plot decision tree all right so let's go ahead and run that line all right so to the bottom right of the console you will see the actual decision tree and you can zoom in and if you zoom in you will see the results all right so for me this font is a bit small so 
let's improve our fund, increase our fund size. 0.7. All right, so here we go. So after zooming in, this is our decision tree. We have our branches. We have the nodes that where the decision is being split on. And at the very bottom of the tree, we have our leaves. And the leaves represents the class that... Um, identifies if somebody stays with the company or leaves the company now remember in our data a value of one represented that the person left the company and a value of zero means that the person stayed with the company so all our nodes in green you will see where the first value in them is one. All right, so these represent the leaves for the individuals who have left the company. And then in blue, you'll see zeros as the first values. These represent those persons who stayed with the company. Now, let's look at a branch to the left of the tree. And let's explain what these rules are so this is saying where the employee satisfaction level is greater than or equal to 47 percent these people if they have been with the company for less than five years they are likely to stay so that's what this zero means that's the class they're likely to stay with the company the second value is the purity of the node and this 0 0.01 here means 1% of the data that is included in this node um, has some impurity. 1% of them um, consists of information for persons who actually left the company. So this node is not pure. The 59% here represents the percentage of the overall data that ends up with this classification. If we move to the right of this branch, so we would read this as those persons whose satisfaction level is greater than or equal to 47% and have been with the company for more than five years. And on their last evaluation, they received 81, less than 81%. These people also stay with the company and the impurity in the node is 4%, and this 5% means 5% of the data ended up in this node. Now, let's look at a rule when somebody actually left the company. So we start here at the top. For those persons whose satisfaction level is less than 47%, and the number of projects that they're working on at the company is greater than or equal to 3 and their satisfaction level is even further less than 12 percent these persons are likely to leave the company um, six percent of the data ends up here now this one here represents the purity but in this case the purity is represented as an inverse um, for, the, for the nodes in green versus the nodes in blue. For the nodes in blue, the second value represents the, the impurity. And for the nodes in green, the second value represents the purity. So for here, we're saying that this node is 100% pure. However, this corresponding leaf is saying there is 7% impurity, all right? So it is the inverse for those in green. It represents purity. So for this leaf here, this is 92% pure. However, this one says there is no impurity in this node. Now, the last thing I want to bring your attention to is the variation in the
colors for the blue and the green so the darker blue you have a greater level of purity with these nodes so if you look at this node and this node they are much darker they have no impurity in them so of course with the lighter blue they have more impurity so this has nine percent impurity and this one has seven percent impurity when compared to this node which is completely pure the same is true for the green the darker the shade the more pure the node thing that we need to do is to calculate the accuracy of our tree now to calculate the accuracy of our tree we have to compare how the tree predicts if somebody will leave or stay with a company versus what actually happened and then we look at the mean score so the first thing is that we must run the test data against our model so our test data is in HR test and we're going to run it against the model and we must store the results in a variable I'm going to store my results in a variable called p1 and use the arrow again so the less than followed by the minus sign and we want to predict thumbs up we choose predict and we want to do the prediction based on the model results that are stored in my results so that has the model and we're going to run against the model some new data and the new data is the HR test data all right and again the type is equal to class in quotes all right and we run that now we can we run the line if all is good we'll see it at the bottom of the console but there are usually there there are results in these variables so we can highlight just p1 and run it and you see there are results here in p1 right so the comment here is that we run test data against the model all right so we have run the, 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 the test data the next next thing is that we need the actual data so when you look in HR test HR tests has some values here that represents on the left in HR tests whether somebody stayed or left the company so this actually happened these are the actual results but we made some predictions on the tree based on running the test gate data against the model so we want to now compare what actually happened with how the tree predicted it to see if they are the same but we must first to do that we need to take the actual data out of the test file so we type a1 so I'm going to store my actual results in a1 you can call it whatever you like less than sign followed by the minus sign and the results they're integer it's integer because um left is a one or a zero so it's an integer so as integer so as dot integer so we want to take the hr test data and we want to take out the left variable and store it as an integer so to take just that variable out of the file we put the name of the file followed by the dollar sign and that gives us access to all the data in the file so you see all the columns are listed there click on the one that says left 
and comment so we retrieve the left variable from the HR test data file. All right, so now that we have, we can run that line, run it all is well with CJ Blue. Let's look at what is in A1. So that's our actual results. So when we look at the console, we have two sets of results. We have what is in what are what is the prediction and what is the actual results that we took out of the file. So let's look at the calculate the mean to determine if they are equal, if the results of the prediction is equal to the actual results. So to do that, we type mean. And you want the mean of comparing P1 to A1. All right, so we're comparing in IT to compare. If two things are equal, we use the double equal sign. We run that, and the answer is 1, which really represents that it is 100% accurate. So let me put a comment before going into the explanation. So accuracy of the model all right so we can eyeball the data to see if it really is a hundred percent but this one here represents that it's a hundred percent if for example I've gotten 0.8 it would have been 80 percent accurate 0 0.75 75 percent accurate so let's compare for the very first record here record one if this was predicted as somebody look at one was predicted as somebody leaving the company in the actual result the person actually left the company record two the same thing here record two the same thing if you go to the very end say the last three record record 47 to 49 or stay with the company and if you look at our last three record, they all stay with the company. So if we're supposed to match them up, if if we're supposed to match them up, we would recognize that they are all the same. So it's a hundred percent accurate. So now that we have our model, we have the accuracy. The next step is really how do we apply these results what should the company do with these results so the aim was to assess what affects somebody leaving or staying with a company so um, a company carrying out this exercise would be interested in what is impacting their attrition rate so i'll give you one idea that can be used um, this data could be used to create programs to address concerns of the employee base based on the things that affect them leaving. So for example, with the model and the results where we see that persons whose satisfaction level is less than 47%, and they have more than three projects and their satisfaction level is even further less than 12 percent that there is a concern for hr so that should be an issue that the human resource department um, tries to assess in terms of what is impacting this low level of employee satisfaction that is impacting these persons leaving the company and potentially create some intervention programs to improve staff morale or increase their level of satisfaction in the working environment. So that is one way that the results can be applied. 
let me hear from you on ELS on what you think could be done with other results um, that are based on the rules that are in this model for the company. Of course, the accuracy of the model is 100%, which means that um, the model performs very well. There were no errors in the prediction, and this is something that is highly reliable in terms of the performance of the model based on this accuracy level. So also remember to save your files. And um, I have another exercise that I want you to do on your own. Remember, you can always copy and paste the code that you, you have been given and modified for other exercises. So here's a script. If any of you are having any issues with um, errors in creating the model i have placed the script on this slide that you can go ahead and copy and paste and execute and you should get your results accordingly so for exercise two you're encouraged to do this one on your own it's very similar to the one that we have done before there are two data sets on the ELS, there's the diabetic data and the diabetic test data. So you need to download those two files, import them similarly how we did with the HR and HR test data. Now, the diabetic data is originally from the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. The objective is to predict based on diagnostic measurements whether a person has diabetes or will have diabetes. Several constraints are placed on the file. Um, so this is from a larger database. So we have extracted a small amount of data. So for this database, all the patients are females and they're at least 21 years old. So they're 21 and older and they're of Indian heritage. So of course, the elements that make up this um, data set, the attributes are if they've been pregnant, number of times they've been pregnant, glucose, their blood pressure, skin thickness, insulin, BMI, diabetes, pedigree function, their age, and what we're predicting was the outcome, which is zero or one. This outcome represents if they've had diabetes. So one is yes they've had diabetes and zero is no no diabetes so that's our prediction so go ahead open your file load it similarly with the hr similar to the hr exercise and go ahead and change the variables that needs to be changed and execute So this is the end of lecture 7 and 8.